Hi, this is Maria Olson. You may know me from Trophy Heads or Starry Eyes and maybe Paranormal Activity 3. And I want to welcome you to Anthony T's Horror Show because it's an awesome show. Hi, my name is Jessica Cameron and you're listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Hey, fellow horror fans. This is Troy Escamella, the director of Party Night and Mrs. Claus. And you are listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Enjoy. Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm Anthony T. In this edition, I will be talking to James L. Edwards, director of the film. Her name was Krista, in which he also stars in the film as well. He's also an actor who's known for many of J.R. Brookwater's films, such as Polymorph, Ozone, and The Dead Next Door. So, uh, it's going to be an interesting interview. But first, there were some TerrorCon announcements, as I've been away for a while, and I haven't had time to do TerrorCon announcements due to the last couple episodes being interview episodes only. So, TerrorCon recently announced a lot of guests, and they're going to do a Halloween reunion. They've announced that Scout, Taylor Compton, Kristen Klebs, Dag Fair. If I pronounce it, which I think I pronounced it wrong, I do apologize. It's such a hard last name to pronounce. William Forsythe is also joining the Halloween reunion. And Tyler Maine, who was also previously announced, will be there as well as part of the Rob Zombie's Halloween reunion. Other TerraCon guests announced include Kane Hodder, David Howard Thornton from Terrifier, Wrestler the Horror King Vinnie Maseglia will also be there as well. Linda Blair from The Exorcist will also be there. So the lineup is starting to fill up for TerrorCon, which takes place June 13th and 14th at the Rhode Island Convention Center. In other con news, CT Horror Fest recently announced that R.A. Manhoff will not be attending the convention as he's double booked for another convention that weekend. CT Horror Fest announced that they'll announce another guest at a later date. And with that, that's the news. Every day there's a family struggling with hospital bills to care for their sick child who is fighting an illness. There's a woman who is fighting breast cancer and is having trouble making ends meet while paying for their treatment. And there are burn victims that are going through treatments to heal their deep wounds. There is a charity in the horror community that helps these people. Scares That Care is an organization that helps families deal with the bills for their child. They help women get the treatment they need to fight breast cancer. And they help people who are dealing with severe burns get the help they need to heal. Scares That Care is a 100% volunteer organization and 501c3 nonprofit charity that is dedicated to helping these people in fighting real monsters. To find out more information or to donate to Scares That Care, you can go to www.scaresthatcare.org. Every donation helps Scares That Care fight real monsters. Besides Anthony T's Horror Show, you can also listen to these other fine podcasts on the Doc Discussions Network. Doc Discussions, hosted by Phil Perone and Michael Darwin. You Know Nothing, Jon Snow, a Game of Thrones podcast. Bullets, Brothels, and Bots, a Westworld podcast. 
Halloween Boutique Psychotronic Reviews and Searching for American Gods. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and Doc Discussions is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Welcome back. Now, recently in the horror community, we lost a very talented director. He was very well known for such films as Reanimator, From Beyond. I'm talking about director Stuart Gordon, who sadly passed away between episodes at the age of 72. He was a very good director who really put out some great stuff that to this day has a following. I remember, quite frankly, the first Stuart Gordon film that I watched. It was like back when I was very young, back in the day when HBO and Cinemax would air all these low-budget B-movies. You occasionally see films like Puppet Master... The Brain, and many other low-budget films airing on those cable channels. It was really that golden time for all these B-movies and low-budget horror films to actually get exposure on major cable networks. I remember when I was a young child watching a film called Dolls. At the time, I never knew who Stuart Gordon was. I was watching this film because... I think my parents had it on, even though they weren't big into horror. It was pretty much a film with dolls. I think my father was mostly into the horror sci-fi genre. But I remember watching that film, Dolls, kind of being a little frightened at the time. I don't know, I was like 8, 9, 10 at the time. There are some movies that I definitely know I saw when I was very young, and Dolls was one of them. It's a long time, because I really can barely remember watching it there. I know I watched it on television, but it's been so long that you just don't remember a lot of things. Now back to what I was saying with Stuart Gordon. I really wasn't interested in his work until... I saw Castle Freak, and the reason why I saw Castle Freak at the time, because I was a huge Full Moon Features fan. I would get up early in the morning to watch Puppet Master 4, Puppet Master 5, and some of the other Full Moon Features on HBO and Showtime. Those were the days when Full Moon Films were on those channels and other B-movie cult films as well. When they actually played those types of movies on there. So one night I saw Castle Freak listed on cable. So I decided to tape it. And by saying by tape it I mean recording on a VHS. Those were the days. And it really was an odd movie first time seeing it. This is probably I would have to say my teenage years. When I first saw Castle Freak. It's been a while so don't judge me. Because it takes a while with all these recollections. But I liked the film enough. That I started to look out to see if they had Reaminator. Because all the film's marketing said Reaminator. Because Barbara Crampton, Jeffrey Coombs, and Stuart Gordon did this film. Back in 85 I believe. And I never heard about it until Castle Freak. So I literally looked for it. And I remember purchasing it for the first time when it was being distributed by a company called Elite Entertainment. Which I don't think is in existence anymore. And Reaminator is a film that really changed the way I viewed horror films. This is like one of my top three horror films of all time. It really was one of those films where I could watch over and over again. I think I brought maybe like four different copies of it. I know I brought two versions from Elite Entertainment. I know the original version, and they had like a super special edition version of it too I picked up. 
Then I converted the film onto Blu-ray when Anchor Bay Entertainment released it, which is another defunct label, as well Elite Entertainment in Anchor Bay Entertainment are no more. And for good time's sakes, I picked up Reanimator for yet a fourth time. When Arrow Video came out with their version of it, I believe a couple of years ago. And this is definitely the most definite edition of Reanimator. As I picked up the two disc limited edition with the unrated version. It had a lot of new features. Plus features from the previous version. Plus a new integral version. Which combined both the theatrical and TV cuts into one film. Which is worth checking out. I love this film so much. So This is why I loved Stuart Gordon. If I'm willing to buy a film four times. Then your film is definitely a film that is near and dear to me. And Reanimator is a film that is near and dear to me. And it's truly one of the best horror films ever made. From there, got me interested in Stuart Gordon. He was a great director. He's done some really good films. He's done that. He's done From Beyond, which is a really good film, which has a really good lead performance from Barbara Crampton in that film. He's also done a crime thriller called Edmund, starring William H. Macy, with a screenplay by David Mamet. He's also done an, another very good sci-fi cult film called Fortress, the one starring Christopher Lambert and Kurt Wood Smith. film that's pretty much hard to find, but is, was really a very good sci-fi film. Which you should check out if you can find it. It was good 90s sci-fi. He also did a lot of work with Charles Band's Empire Pictures and Full Moon Entertainment. As he directed other films like Robot Jock and The Pit and the Pentalum. He's really done some really good work that I really enjoyed as a fan. He also had his wife Caroline Purdy Gordon in many of his films, in Reanimator, From Beyond, to name a few that's most notable. Stuart Gordon was a great director. He was really one of my favorite cult filmmakers. He's up there with the, along the lines of Charles Band, Lloyd Kaufman. When you think of cult filmmakers, those are like three of the names you think of. It's really sad that he passed away. There has been no cause of death announced. It's truly sad that we will not be seeing any more films or screenplays written by Stuart Gordon. Because he really was a great cult filmmaker. And his films usually entertained to me. And it's sad that he's going to be missed. It is sad that we will not see him direct another film again. At this time, I would like to offer my condolences to Stuart Gordon's family and friends, as Stuart Gordon was a talented director and a talent that will be dearly missed amongst all horror fans. Hey guys, this is Steven Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic-Con coverage all around? Well then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributors. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. They're coming to get you, Barbara. This is Carrie. This is Billy. This is Mr. Bo. And we are from a podcast from beneath. You can catch us every Wednesday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Welcome back to Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm here with writer, director James L. Edwards. He's been in such films as The Dead Next Door, Ozone, Polymorph, and countless others. Today he is here to talk about his directorial debut. Her name 
was Krista. How are you doing today, James? Doing real good. Thanks for having me. No problem. What drew you to the film business? Um, I actually, uh, uh, growing up, just loved horror movies. Just was a huge fan of horror movies. And at the time, I wanted to be a special effects makeup artist. I, uh, I was a Tom Savini kid and just uh, loved Scream Greats and, uh, and Fangoria and just desperately wanted to break into the effects business. Uh, what I soon discovered was I didn't have any real artistic talent. So I basically started doing crew work for uh, Tempe, uh, the company that I worked for out of Akron, Ohio, and then eventually started acting and then screenwriting. You're mostly known from various Tempe entertainment films from the 90s, such as The Dead Next Door, Polymorph, and Ozone. How did you become involved with Jay Brookwater and Tempe Entertainment? I uh, actually had seen uh, a um, uh, a posting in my local newspaper looking for zombies uh, for the Sam Raimi produced uh, The Dead Next Door, and I was 12 years old at the time. When I'd gone in uh, for an interview uh, to be an effects artist, which they actually hired me on as an assistant, and a couple weeks into me working on the film, they quickly discovered I had no clue what I was doing. But they liked my spirit and kept me on as a production assistant. And I did that film, and <clears throat> shortly after that, um, they ended up uh, doing a film called Robot Ninja, which was my acting debut, and I just kind of stuck with it from there. What was it like to work with Brooke Water on those films? Um, I always joke, because I was so young uh, starting out in this, this whole situation was kind of like my own personal Woodstock. There was a, uh, it was literally just eating, sleeping, drinking movies. So it was, as a young child working on these movies, it was a blast. Now I'd be lying if I said it wasn't extremely long hours and hard work, but at the end of the day, you're making a movie. I, I mean, I would much rather um, spend my days making movies than punching a clock somewhere. So, so yeah, it was it was a complete blast. Now, one of those films from the Tempe era, which I really love a lot, is Ozone. And the film recently had some news that it will be hitting Blu-ray for the first time. Now, tell everyone about that film since I mentioned it before. And tell me what was it like to play two characters in that film? That, I always joke, was my Eddie Murphy role, because I not only play... Two different incarnations of the lead villain, Sam, DePart uh, Sam DeBartolo, the human version and the drug lord at the end. But I also play a uh, Hellraiser Cenobite-inspired character called Spikes. And part of the reason that I got that gig was because I was very comfortable under prosthetic makeup. I actually used to work for um, uh, an uh, effects artist, David Barton, who had done The Dead Next Door, Phantasm Two. Uh, Puppet Master 4 and 5, and The Abyss, where um, I basically was his test subject. He, he knew I was comfortable wearing prosthetics, so he would do test makeups on me. And that kind of led me to the job on Ozone because, A, they had used me quite a bit on their previous efforts as an actor, but they also knew that I was the one guy they could go to where I could sit for hours with heavy effects. And it, and it was a very effects-heavy movie. I know the, the the character that I play at the end was supposed to be this 600-pound mutant thing, and the only thing that wasn't covered on me in latex were my legs. Everything else was covered. And, again, it was miserable, but you're making a movie, so you, you can't really complain. Now, what was it like playing that 600-pound character? It's, it's funny because I look back on that, and the lead actor in that film was an actor uh, by the name of James Black, who later went on to do... The Matthew Broderick Godzilla film, uh, Out of Sight with um, uh, George Clooney, uh, Soldier with Kurt Russell, and he was a recurring character on the Charlie Sheen uh, show, um, uh, Anger Management. Um, James was absolutely a blast to work with, but he was infamous for being very overzealous in the uh, in the action scenes, so it was not uncommon to get hurt if you were working with James. So I'm under the I'm under literally like. Probably, I'm going to say 60 to 70 pounds worth of foam latex. And I can, and I had to over enunciate all of my dialogue because the jaw didn't quite line up with my actual jaw. So I had to go back in later and re record the dialogue. There's a scene towards the end where 
James comes James comes running in and knocks a knife out of my hand and is supposed to punch me in the jaw. Well, we did it a couple of times, and the room that we're in, it's the middle of summer. I've got all of this latex on me, and I've all and it's also like 102 degrees in the room. So I'm I'm melting in this thing. Well, one of the takes, James comes over and knocks the knife out of my hand and clocks me in the side of, in in my jaw, and he actually connected. And I felt this little trickle of warm liquid go down my face. I'm like, oh, no, I, I, I'm I, bleeding. <laughs> well, it turned out what had happened was uh, we continued the scene, and I just I left it alone. And Because at that point, they'd have to take the full suit off. There's no way we could have kept filming. So I'm like, you know what, just heck with it. Let's just keep going for it. They, um, what had happened was it was so hot in that room, the adhesive that had glued the piece to my face had come loose when he hit me, and I just felt a trickle of sweat run down my face. It still hurt, but thank God, uh, uh, thank God I wasn't uh, actually uh, injured. Now, if you had to choose a favorite film that you worked on with J.R. Brookwater, which one would it be? As far as him directing, I did really enjoy working on Ozone quite a bit. Uh, as far as a Tempe released film, my favorite was always Bloodletting. That was the 1996 or 97 serial killer film where I play a serial killer teaching a basically a, a serial killer groupie how to kill and i just i really enjoyed that i had a lot of fun with it i got a lot of recognition out of it um it just it, all around it, it was a fun movie what made you decide to go into the director's chair for the first time after being mostly an actor for most of your career i had taken kind of a i'm gonna say a seven or eight year semi-retirement because what had happened was i had gotten married and my wife was not real. My wife, my <clears throat> excuse me, my wife loved the fact that I was an actor when we had first gotten together. But once we were married and had kids, she felt that it took too much time away from the family. And I decided, OK, well, that's fine. I'll step away. Well, when we divorced, I felt a real a real sense of um, uh, basically time lost, because at that point I was 40 years old. I was, I had not done a film in a while, and I really felt that I had kind of squandered away a lot of time that could have been, been used making films. So I had reached a point where I was probably, and this is going to sound really depressing, but I was probably in the lowest part of my life. Like I said, I had just turned 40. I was in the process of being, of getting a divorce. I was a single parent. I didn't know what my prospects were going to be. And I just remember looking in the mirror and going, is this it? Is this is this how everything ends? And it really inspired me to kind of create a screenplay about the fears of getting older and about the fears of dying alone. And that's where Krista first originated. Now, it wasn't until a couple of years later where I actually uh, I actually sat down and wrote the script, but that's where the original Genesis came from. The idea to direct was because... Initially, I had no intention of directing the film. I was meeting with multiple directors to basically see if I could hire someone to do the film. And for good reason, they all wanted to put their own little spin on the, the material. And I just, I was very adamant that I, there was a specific way I wanted the film to go. Well, my producer, Sherry Rose, finally came to me and said, look, you've met with all these directors and you're not getting what you want. Why don't you just direct it? And I very arrogantly said, oh yeah, I can, I've been on enough movie sets. I can do that. And we finished it, and I'm, I could not be happier with the film. I will say that it was probably the most difficult project I've ever worked on, simply because of the fact with playing a lead character who is not only in the entirety of the film, but also is so incredibly meek and just just emotionally damaged. And then the minute I call cut, I have to be in charge. It was, it was very trying. Speaking of her name was Krista... Tell me about your film and the character you play in it. Uh, the film is essentially um, a, um, I mean, it, it pretty much starts off as a romantic drama where um, I play a character named Steven, who is a middle-aged, socially awkward uh, telemarketer who, at the suggestion of a co-worker, uh, goes out into the night to find a prostitute for what's called the girlfriend experience. And there he meets Krista who essentially he wants to pay to simulate a uh, relationship. And they agree to terms, but during the course of their business arrangement, they actually do fall in love. The problem with that is that 
situations happen where death comes into the picture, and at that point, Stephen, who's already emotionally damaged, right, and pretty much has a lot of mental issues we soon discover, has to deci- uh, decide whether he wants to continue the relationship or not. Were you dead set on playing the lead in this film, or did you had to give it some thought before deciding? Oh, no, it it was always that I wanted to play the lead in this, even more so before I decided to direct it. The thing was, I wanted very desperately to prove that I could act. I'd I'd acted in in dozens of films before that. The problem was, a lot of people during that time saw me more of as a personality than an actor. uh, There was a lot of accusations that I was always playing myself, or that it was more of I was always cast as the same roles, And don't get me wrong, I'm always appreciative of the roles I can secure. It's just I'd reached a point where I was tired of playing roles that I really didn't want to play, and I also was tired of turning in my screenplays. And again, like I said, it makes sense where directors would take the material and turn it into something that I didn't envision. So this was my opportunity to pretty much do exactly precisely what I wanted to do for a film. Were there times where you were overwhelmed with both acting and directing this film? Oh, yeah, 100%. There were many times. And again, I uh, I think a lot of it was because I went into this very naive, where it's like, well, I've been doing this since 85. This will be a cakewalk. What I didn't take into consideration was the fact that typically as an actor, I have the luxury of going, coming to set, doing my scenes, and walking away from it. When you're directing... You pretty much live that project until it is released to the public. And that was something that took a lot of getting used to. Now, again, the the plus side to that is I am happier with Her Name Was Krista than any project I've ever done. It's pretty much, they say that as a director, um, as long as you can get like 30% of your vision onto the screen, you've done your job. Well, not to sound arrogant, but I truly believe from what I envisioned when I wrote the script to the final product... It's pretty much 95% exactly what I wanted, so I have absolutely zero complaints and would be happy to do it again. Were you your own worst critic when directing yourself? Um, you know, that's that's a difficult question, because on one hand, yes, I, I do tend to try and make sure that everything is perfect as possible, but I'm also a huge egomaniac, so I can be my own worst critic, but I can also be my biggest cheerleader. So I, I guess it's dependent on... Uh, what, what day uh, What day you're talking to me? What was it like casting the role for Krista? As I noticed on one of the DVD extras that you put out a nationwide search to cast the character. That actually was probably one of the biggest hurdles. When the script was initially written, I had in mind an actress that uh, was hired for the role, who um, she and I in the 90s had done... Uh, It it basically made a semi-name for ourselves as kind of like an indie horror couple. We had done several movies together where uh, we played uh, love interests. And we hadn't worked in 20 years, and this project was originally going to be our reunion film, our our basically our, our, our comeback film. And unfortunately, situations arose where we... Just, it didn't work out. Uh, basically, we, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna respectfully call it artistic differences, and I had to let her go. So, that left us in a bad situation in the sense that at that point, I had already filmed probably, I'm gonna say, six of our 18 day shoot of the film, and now we have no lead actress. <clears throat> now, luckily, we had not shot anything with her. At that point, we'd only shot with the other actors. But I, we basically, <clears throat> went through every means that we could to find a new actress. And we actually interviewed or auditioned 73 actresses for the role of Krista, some of which were actually uh, indie veterans um, of films that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, all the way to relative newcomers. And it wasn't until the very last audition that I took where I found Cheyenne Day, and Cheyenne was just phenomenal. She just, she was everything that I was looking for in the character. She was an amazing actress. She was very easygoing. The problem was that she had not acted in quite a while. She mostly worked as a model in runway and print work. So I opted to continue to put the film on hiatus so I could spend the next two to three months 
in rehearsals with her. And I really, I mean, I thought that I personally think that was um, probably one of the best decisions I made on this film, simply because of the fact it gave us the opportunity, being not familiar with each other, to get to know each other so we could play a couple. And it gave her a lot more of a comfort level of doing something that she wasn't familiar with. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the best things about the film was your chemistry with Cheyenne. As you used to really played off each other brilliantly. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. As it really, I think, helps make this film very good, especially towards the end of the film, where it gets thank really you. demented. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm going to spoil about this film. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a first-time director with no directing experience. How did the producers of the film trust you to direct this film? Because I've seen indie films in the past where a first-time director is also a producer as well. Well, the nice thing about this project <clears throat> was the fact that even though it was my first time directing, I had enough credits under my belt that the majority of the people that had come aboard on the film had not done as much film work as I had. So to my knowledge, there was never a concern on whether or not um, I could pull it off. Um, again, a lot of these people had never done a movie before, and the ones that had, I had worked with so much in the past that they knew what I was capable of. Um, that and the fact that I had worked as a producer on several films before this, I, I really think that helped out a lot. Now, were there any times where the producers tried to step in and say, no, you can't do that? Um, I don't believe so, no. I mean, I, it was very, I was very adamant when choosing my producers. Because, um, again, keep in mind, the majority of the film itself was... was uh, um, was either funded through Indiegogo, which unfortunately our Indiegogo uh, campaign failed miserably. We did not come anywhere near our goal. Um, was funded by an outside source who completely trusted me and also was self-funded. So the nice thing about those situations is you pretty much get to avoid having to deal with producers that have their own ideas. My own producer on Krista, uh, Sherry Rose, was a relative newcomer. So it worked out really well to where it, it was everything that I'd hoped it would be in the sense that a producer's job is essentially to do to do everything necessary to make the film come to life to the director's uh, uh, wishes. Now, a lot of times that gets very muddled in producers who want to become artistically involved. I've, I've been in situations like that, and it's no fun. That was never the case with this, which I was very fortunate on. What were some of the challenges with funding since you mentioned that your Indiegogo campaign failed? The biggest problem that I see and that a lot of indie filmmakers see that I've talked to is trying to raise money for these projects. Um, my original goal was to raise $30,000 for this film, and it did not happen. Uh, we, we did make, get the film in much lower than that. Um, our Indiegogo was going to be a partial... Uh, a uh, a partial budget of 10000 we raised a little over 1000 which was a complete failure. Um, again, I was very fortunate that I had an outside investor who was willing to put up a good portion of the money as well. And aside from that, I just maxed out credit cards. So it was like, it's always just one of those things where now, again, is that the smart way to do it? Probably not. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that uh, fundraisers aren't the way to go. I know several directors who have immense success with that. I know uh, Todd Sheets does very well with that. Uh, Henry Cotto out of um, uh, Dayton does very well with that. So it can be done. But as far as my situation, no, it did not help at all. Now, what was it like shooting this film, considering the constraints you had? Um, you know what? I will say this. I really feel the trick, and this is speaking as a first-time director, the trick to making a successful indie film and at least having your production go smoothly, always hire people that are far more talented than yourself. I had two really phenomenal uh, uh, cinematographers. I had an absolutely genius effects artist. I had an amazing cast. My crew was 
so fantastic. I, I, there was not a bad person in the bunch, and that's a rarity in produ- productions that I've worked with in the past. Usually, there's always something that's going to go wrong. I had very little trouble with production. Um, the only trouble that I ever had was sometimes scheduling became very difficult when you have that many people involved. And I know a few of our locations, due to weather, were a little difficult. But aside from that, no, I, I have no complaints about the production. I, I had far more trouble in post-production than I did in actual production. What was the most difficult scene to shoot? The most difficult scene to shoot, for me personally, were the love scenes. Because typically, I don't care who you are, the love scenes between even actors that know each other well are always uncomfortable, awkward, weird. Um, and it makes it even worse where it's like you're expecting your lead actress, who is relatively new at this, to basically understand, okay, I've written this and I'm directing it, and you're expected to have three pretty extensive love scenes. And again, the problem with that is that you didn't used to be like that, but again, after the Harvey Weinstein incident and a lot of the the new accusations came up, you have to be very careful with that. You know, there are directors out there, there are many filmmakers out there that use filmmaking as a dating service, and it's made it a lot more difficult for the rest of us, because with something like that, trust needs to be an issue. Now, the one thing that I had to my advantage on that was the fact that, again, Cheyenne and I had spent all that time in rehearsal, so there was a... There were, even though... She had not done this before. It was there was a level of comfort there and a level of trust. So that definitely helped. But it always cracks me up because typically guys, when they watch the film, will be like, "Oh, you must have had that. Must have been amazing." To, 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 it's like, no, it was just absolutely miserable. But you'd never know it on film. <laughs> now you briefly mentioned you had trouble with post production. What were some of the difficulties that you had in post production? The problems that I had stemmed from the fact that a lot of people that I counted on, unfortunately, fell through. Uh, Our original actress uh, did not work out. My original cameraman, unfortunately, fell sick, and I had to replace him. When it got to uh, post-production, that's when the real, excuse me, that's when the real trouble started. My original composer and sound designer, uh, for lack of a better word, flaked out, and I had to replace them. I, we had a a lot of technical issues, mostly sound-wise, that were a concern that luckily uh, worked out. Um, One of the people that actually saved me quite a bit on that was, um, uh, t- uh, Tempe Video had J.R. Bookwalter. We had not, uh, we had actually had a falling out, um, I'm going to say in the early 2000s. And we hadn't spoken 15 years. And this movie actually got us speaking again. And not only did he agree to come aboard um, in a cameo in Krista, but he also was a tremendous savior as far as the post production work. Uh, between him and Gary Lee Vincent, um, uh, uh, Kendall Williams and, uh, my composer, Matthew Sturgeon, all of that, that team combined just really, really made a film that I was already very proud of into something that to me was just absolutely amazing. So I, I truly, I couldn't have done it without anyone involved, but I re- they really, really saved the day on that. Now, speaking of J.R. Brookwater, what was it like directing him instead of the other way around? Uh, very, very surreal. Uh, I'll tell you that. Um, <clears throat> like I said, JR and I hadn't spoken 15 years. And when I was promoting the Indiegogo, I had noticed that he was nice enough to share the post and do a small write up asking people to donate to the campaign. So I reached out to him. I had, like I said, I hadn't spoke to him in over a decade. And I just explained, Hey, you know, I know there's some bad blood between us, but I wanted to let you know I really, truly appreciate you getting the word out on my film, that was a, a real class act. And I also want you to know that I'm well aware that if it wasn't for you, I would not have had the opportunities in cinema that I've had, and I wouldn't be directing my own movie. And he contacted me back. He's like, look, you know what? Any problems that we had, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter anymore. He's like, we're both older. We're both parents now. There are far bigger things going on in our life than this feud. So I completely get it. 
So we got together for lunch, and um, I just explained to him, hey, uh, there's a part in – I need you to do me a favor. There's a part in this that I, I want you to do a cameo in. And JR hates acting. He's not a fan of acting at all. But he's like, I feel like – he's like, I want to say no, but I feel like I kind of owe you. I'm like, oh, you absolutely owe me. You're doing this. So, so he came aboard in the cameo, and then we kept in contact, and when – I started running into post-production uh, problems. He basically offered his services to help. And like I said, he was detrimental in getting this film finished. I, I could not have done this without him. Why did you also decide to go with his company, Makeflix, instead of other companies out there? Well, Makeflix is basically just leaning or, or just uh, uh, just um, along the lines of a sub distributor. The film is actually distributed through my company, Buffalo Entertainment Group. But Jr. offered to sell it on his site, um, and I and I uh, I was thrilled. I was like, that would be fantastic, especially considering a lot of my fan base are obviously fans of Tempe movies. So we put it on uh, Makeflix. We it's also available at uh, DiabolicDVD.com as well as, uh, um, oh, uh, Grindhouse Video in Tampa. And um, uh, as far as streaming goes, it's available on Amazon, Amazon UK, Vimeo, uh, Google Play, and there is a retail Blu-ray version that's a movie only. It's just going to be the movie, the trailer, and the commentary that's going to be available on Best Buy, <clears throat> Best Buy, Walmart, Target, and Amazon, as well as Deep Discount DVD. Okay, let's move on to the screenwriting process mm -hmm. how do you come up with the idea for the story uh again that was really the, the 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 genesis of the story really boiled down to me waking up one morning when I, on my 40th birthday and not recognizing the guy in the mirror the idea of just dying and getting older and specifically being alone when you're older is a really really scary prospect for me um, in fact, I, like I said, I know at the, a lot of people like to consider this movie just a necrophilia story. It's like, dude, that's in there. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think that's the main horror focus of this film. In fact, I, if I've done my job, a lot of the necrophilia is done in a way where it's like, it's a horrific thing to see, but you understand why the character is doing it. You don't agree with it, but you understand why. What was the writing process like for this film? Uh, most of my screenplays, whether they're something that I'm doing for myself or a work for hire project, most of them consist of me trying to lock myself away and just just crank out a script. And it's weird because typically I'll write the ending first and then build up from there. And it's a shame because when I was in my 20s, I could literally lock myself in a, in my apartment with a carton of cigarettes and uh, a couple of pots of coffee and crank out a script in two weeks. I can't, I don't have that patience anymore. I, I, I don't have the ability anymore. I'm a, fa I'm a single father of three, so I don't have that time anymore. So the Krista screenplay took about three months to write. And I, I'm seeing more and more now as I write other things that that's pretty much becoming my average speed time now. So but long, long, long gone are the days of me just cranking out a script. But the good news is, at least in my opinion, I'm becoming a lot more um, tedious about it, where it's like I'm less likely to turn in a screenplay that I'm not 100% happy with. What made you want to tell the story from the point of view of the interrogation instead of traditional means? The interrogation scenes were something that I wanted to experiment with. And if you look at the screenplay on that, there's actually a disclaimer where none of the interrogation scenes were scripted. I wanted to treat that as a, um, uh improvisational piece. So what I did was I had gone to a director that I'd worked with in the past, that I, I produced his film, uh, I believe in 2008, a, um, uh, a film called June 9. Uh, his name is T. Michael Conway. He was originally an effects artist for the uh, Killer Nerd films, and he also uh, directed a uh, gritty cop drama called uh, Pig. <clears throat> and I'd gone to Tim. We had been friends for years. And I said, look, I have this project that I'm working on. Um, I told him briefly what – I didn't give him the script. I just basically said, this is the situation. Um, I'm going to tell you what the police would have saw towards the end of this film. And I need you to come up with about two dozen questions as a police officer or a psychiatrist – that they would ask this suspect 
but I don't want to know what they are. I have no interest in knowing what any of the questions are. I want you to hit me with them as we as we roll action. So he came up with them. I went to his studio. We filmed uh, that that sequence in the studio. And again, I had no clue what he was going to ask. And the the actual sequence itself, I believe, clocked in at 32 minutes. And we trimmed it down to the eight minutes that we used in the film. But one of the nice things, and one of my favorite features on the disc, is the full 32-minute interrogation, the full improv piece, is available as an extra on the Krista DVD. What also wanted you to focus on the character's state of mind as it constantly changes during the course of the film? Um, <clears throat> I'm always attracted to haunted characters or characters who are damaged emotionally in some way. So the idea of playing this character that, again, I think... I think we've all been in a situation where we kind of know someone like Stephen, where he's very introverted and very awkward. So that was very attracted, attractive to me. Because typically when an actor writes and directs their own film, not to, not to talk bad, but a lot of times those will come in as like a fluff piece or a, uh, um, uh, an ego boost. I didn't want that. I wanted to, I mean, keep in mind, I, I shaved my uh, shaved my head to look like male pattern baldness for almost two years to play this role. I had put on 45 pounds to play the role. I had that horrible mustache. So it was like there you can't. I mean, you can say a lot of things about the film. You definitely can't say that it was an ego boost. You know, this this was uh, essentially something that I was desperate to prove that I could act, and I felt one of the things that would kind of hammer that home was to physically alter myself as much as humanly possible. You also had your special effects done by Alan Tusks, who's worked on such major horror films such as Cabin Fever, The Devil's Rejects, and From Dust to Dawn. How did he come aboard this project? Alan was a friend of my original cinematographer, uh, Keith Klein, who unfortunately had gotten sick about six days into production and had to walk away from the project. Um, we had met with Alan. He was, um, at the time, working for Precinct 13, which was Robert Kurtzman's company in Cleveland. Uh, Robert Kurtzman was originally with uh, KMB. He was one of the founding members of KMB. And Alan was nice enough to meet with us, and I, I gave him a copy of the script and explained what I was looking for, and he liked the idea and wanted to come aboard. Um, <clears throat> it was weird because... Alan is an incredibly successful film. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Alan is an incredibly successful effects artist. To give you an idea, the, the week before he was shooting with me on Krista, he was shooting um, a uh, he was doing burn makeup for a Helen Hunt project. Uh, the week after he was shooting on Krista, he was doing a film with Bruce Willis. So I, I mean, this is somebody who. Uh, the, the project of Christo was something that he could have very easily turned down, but he, luckily for me, believed in the project. He and I got along famously, and I, I actually just uh, just talked to him last week, um, and he just adored the film. He was so happy with the way it turned out, and he even went as far as one of the reviews had mentioned his effects, and he even said, you know, that was the uh, he said the the compliment that they gave him on the effects was the nicest thing anybody has ever said about his effects work and so i was completely proud of that i was so happy to to not only have him involved but to give him that as well yeah the effects were very good in this film and it really gave you that feel where this is very disturbing it's one of those films where essentially i'm expecting the audience and who I'm well aware because of my background. Um, I'm expecting the audience who are expecting an all-out horror film to be comfortable with watching a romantic drama for three-fourths of the movie. So for that last half hour, I better give them something that's going to shock them. And again, for between the gore and the sex, I wanted to be something that would be horrific, but at the same token, beautiful. I didn't want to teeter into pornographic, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to push the edge, or push towards the edge, or push the envelope. And I think we've done that. I really do. What was it like to work with someone like Alan on that film, who's worked on countless major films? 
Um, Alan was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, he literally, uh, he was very easygoing. He was a blast to have on the set and incredibly professional. And like I said, I mean, I think that definitely shows in his work in the film. There are several effects in the film that, uh, I mean, to this day, I just, I'm in awe of. Would you considering acting and directing again at the same time? Absolutely. Uh, my goal at this point, I did, I mean, again, I, playing the role that I did and directing for Krista, again, it was emotionally daunting, but I'm so happy with the results, I am going to continue directing and acting. And, in fact, we are in the final stages right now of our sophomore effort that I've, I've directed and I'm acting in. Uh, it's a uh, horror anthology that I'm hopefully going to be able to announce here uh, within the next couple of months. What are some upcoming projects that people can look forward to from you? Well, at this point, like I said, the anthology I'm hoping to have out by August, and I will be announcing that within uh, probably by the end of next month. I just want to, uh, unfortunately, with this coronavirus thing, everything's on hold. Uh, there's nobody's filming right now. Everybody's just wondering what our future is going to look like. My goal is, luckily with the anthology already completely shot and in post-production right now, most of the work on that that would have been damaged by the uh, quarantine um, is no longer an issue. So we're going to continue pushing forward with that. Um, I'm uh, trying to uh, get a project off the ground for an indie filmmaker named Tim Novotny, who actually worked for my on my uh, as my lighting uh, um, designer on Krista. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's directed some films in the past, a vampire film called Pharisee that I have a cameo in, as well as a film called Vile Prey. But he uh, is um, in the process of raising funding for a '70s uh, uh, mafia film called Gemini, which I'll be producing as well as acting in. Um, I also am in negotiations right now to um, do a film for a Dayton filmmaker, um, um, uh, uh, Adam Clevenger. And aside from that, uh, just basically uh, trying to get as many projects off the ground as possible. I have another full-length feature that I'd like to get off the ground after the anthology, but again, it's all going to be dependent on funding. What special features can people find on the Her Name Was Krista DVD Blu-ray combo release? There, um, the way we did the uh, the releases is both the DVD as well as the Blu-ray DVD combo uh, feature over an hour and a half worth of extras. Uh, there is an audio commentary, uh, two trailers, um, um, uh, Cheyenne Day's original audition tape, um, let's see, two rehearsal videos, the full, uh, uh, Steven interrogation scene, a uh, short film directed by, um, uh, um, associate producer Brad Twig, starring Rick Germain, who plays Blaze in, uh, Krista, called Alan's Got Some Time to Kill, and Ameris, uh, the Americision, uh, promo video, and I think that might be, oh, and a few deleted scenes as well. How can they purchase her name was Krista? Her name is her name was Krista can be purchased as a special edition through me direct on Facebook. Uh, just look for me as James L. Edwards. I believe the actual lookup is Facebook slash uh, James L. Edwards three. Um, you, you can also find uh, order it through the her name was Krista um, Facebook page. If you order it that way, you get the uh, either the Blu-ray or the DVD. The Blu-ray is $25, the DVD is $20, and that includes free shipping, two free mini posters, and the option to have the item signed. Uh, you can also uh, get the film um, on DVD and Blu-ray through makeflix.com, uh, uh, diabolicdvd.com, grindhousevideo.com, and, um, the, again, there will be a retail version that's a Blu-ray only that's available through Amazon, Target, Walmart, uh, Best Buy, and Deep Discount DVD. Uh, if you're looking for the film streaming, you can find it for rent or purchase on Amazon, Amazon UK, Vimeo, and um, uh, Google Play. And, again, one thing that I do ask is that anybody who's seen the film, if they enjoy it, please uh, do me uh, do me a kindness and go on IMDb or Amazon and give us a star rating. And if you have the time, a small review. I would greatly appreciate it. Where can they find you in the film on social media? 
Um, again, I have a, uh, you can track me down on Facebook. Um, I, uh, I'm very good about getting back, so leave me a message. Um, you can also go to the Her Name Was Krista uh, Facebook page. James, I want to thank you for coming on to my podcast. Stay safe and have a good day. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. For the latest news and information on Anthony T's Horror Show, you can check out Anthony T's Horror Show on the social media platforms at Anthony T's Horror Show on Facebook, Instagram, and Slasher app at Anthony T's Horror on Twitter. Anthony T's Horror Show can be found on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash Anthony Thurber. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and you can find Anthony T's Horror Show on the web at anthonytshorrorshow.blogspot.com Welcome back. It's been a bit, but what Anthony T been watching is back. Unfortunately, it's a somber one since back earlier in the show I talked about Stuart Gordon, and lately I've been watching some of his work as he was a very good director. But the film I'm going to talk about right now is his film that I really think is a very underrated film. I'm talking about the film Castle Freak. I talked about it a little briefly when I was talking about my tribute to Stuart Gordon, but this is a very underrated film from his filmography. It really shows the talents of Stuart Gordon because this film is a very dark, very dreary, very H.P. Lovecraft type of a film. And I can, quite frankly, think it's Stuart Gordon's most disturbing film out of his filmography. One of the reasons why I think Castle Freak is Stuart Gordon's most underrated film is the way that Gordon does a very good job making sure everything has a very dreary feel to it, whether he approaches his direction in the film, to the way that the film look, everything had a very dark, dreary tone something that you would let see out of an hp lovecraft story it really helped make this film very good and very entertaining for me he also did a great job with directing the dramatic scenes in the film especially the dynamic between jeffrey coombs and barbara crampton in that film as those scenes really work very well it kept me interested in all the drama that was surrounding the story of the film. It really never felt dull. And I was very interested in the characters and the relationship in the film, which deteriorates during the course of the film. Another thing that really also made his direction very good was he also makes sure that the action and the horror is on par with the drama, as the action and horror in this film is very intense. There's a couple of very disturbing moments in the film, and it really had a great last 15-20 minutes of the film, as it really ramped up the tension to the climactic finale, which really made this film very good. It also helped that... He had very good performances in the film from Jeffrey Coombs and Barbara Crampton, whom always seemed to be very good in Stu Gordon films. They were both very good in Reanimator and From Beyond. But I think Castle Freak is the better of the three films from an acting standpoint with those two actors, because they really did a great job with their performances and it also helped that Stuart Gordon is a very good director and he knows their strengths and it really shows in Castle Freak as they did a great job with all the dramatic stuff and the action stuff including the film's finale definitely check out Castle Freak if you can because this is definitely a very underrated Stuart Gordon film it's very underrated like Fortress too but 
Castle Freak is really a Stuart Gordon film that you should check out. It also has a very good score from Richard Band as well. So definitely check out Castle Freak as this film is probably Stuart Gordon's most gothic film of his whole filmography. It's really sad that we won't get any more films from Stuart Gordon as he really is a great director and this one kind of hurts because I love cult cinema and Stuart Gordon was definitely one of the best cult directors out there. So definitely check out Castle Freak when you have a chance or if you're a big Stuart Gordon fan like I am and haven't seen the film, you should definitely check it out. It is his most underrated film. Castle Freak is currently available on DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming. Definitely check this film out if you're a big Stuart Gordon fan because this was really one of Stuart Gordon's best films. And that's what I've been watching. Before I end this episode of Anthony T's Horror Show, I do have an announcement to make. And that is, I'm going back to writing reviews for horror films. Now, does this mean I'm leaving the podcast? No. It's just I really want to get back to writing so I can catch up on some of the late horror films and other films that I want to review. As I also have a blog called filmarcade.net, which just truly will be reviving. And it's going to consist of right now just news and reviews. Anthony T's Horror Show's website at anthonytshorrorshow.blogspot.com will continue as they'll be the home for all the episodes, whether it's MP3 or YouTube. So don't worry, that site's not going. But I'm moving all the horror stuff and everything to filmarcade.net because I do have some plans for it, but I won't talk about it now as I'm going to start a new podcast soon. I haven't forgotten about that. It's just with all this craziness going on right now. I feel it's not the time to start a new podcast. As it's just too much stress and everything. So I'm hoping this t- by summer I can start a new podcast. Which will be different from Anthony T's Horror Show, of course. As I really want to interview people from the non-horror side of everything. More like a pop culture side. So, keep an eye on that. And I will also have a review up for We Summon the Darkness. It's a new film that stars Alexandria Dodaro and Johnny Knoxville. So, it should be up on filmarcade.net now. If not, it'll be up very soon. So, definitely check out that review. And very soon, I will be... uh. Announcing the first, and I'm telling you, the first rankings of 2020 for Best Horror Films. As I'm doing a thing on Letterboxd, and you will see my first list of what I think are the top horror films of 2020 so far. You can find the rankings over at AnthonyTeesHorrorShow.blogspot.com. I also have a link of it. On Facebook and the Slasher app. As I may also have a picture up there too. With the complete rankings and everything. So with that, have a good day. Stay safe and support indie horror.